Apache Con Asia. This is Maxim Wheatley, and it's such an honor to be presenting this year. I want to thank the committee for selecting my proposal, and I want to thank you, the audience, for choosing to listen to my presentation today and for joining me in this session. So today we're going to talk about the lessons learned launching a project that is now part of the Apache Foundation's fantastic incubator program, a project called DevLake, uh, a project that I'm incredibly proud to have had a leadership role in. So what are we going to cover today? I'm gonna to give you a brief introduction to myself and my background, um, as well as the background of the project so that you can understand all of this in the context. Then I'm splitting this out into three key phases. I'm going to talk a little bit about what did we do during the preparation phase to make this project a success? Then we're going to talk about what happened during the launch phase. What does the launch day look like? How do you build that launch, launch plan and strategy? And then what happens immediately after to keep the momentum growing? Then we're going to talk about community development, perhaps one of the most important pieces, the sustainable part of the growth that's driven by the heart and soul of open source, which is the community, the developers, how the world are engaging with your project. How are we doing that? And perhaps most importantly, how are we using data about our code base, about our repo and everything wrapped around it to actually grow and successfully build this project today. Lastly, I wanted to highlight what our project actually does with some interesting benchmark data that we produced analyzing the Apache ecosystem with some of the leading open source projects as in comparing those also to the Apache incubators own projects. I think you'll find the data quite interesting and I'm excited to review it with you. So who am I and why am I qualified to talk to you today? So my name is Maxim Wheatley. I'm based here in Los Angeles, California. However, I've worked all over around the world and today I have the honor of working for a company called Merico, where we are a global company with a large team based in Beijing and developers and teammates around the world. I joined as employee number five and today we have about 100 colleagues building fantastic developer technology. I'm also a member of the Apache DevLake project that is currently undergoing incubation. So what is DevLake and how did we do all of this? Well, first I want to let this chart tell a little bit of the story here. You can see here that early on, we were in this preparation mode. We got the repo going. Um, we started working on the project internally, getting it ready to be released to the, to the global community. Then in about mid-December, we launched the project with all kinds of preparation that I'm about to go into and share some lessons for. We had this fantastic, exciting launch. Our developers were dancing, literally dancing on, on camera to celebrate the quick growth of this and just how excited the world was about their work. And it was, of course, a huge honor for me to be a part of growing that and to bring their impressive achievements and the hard work that they had done on this code base, bringing it to the world. Then, of course, we'll talk about how we transitioned from this rocket ship growth on launch into this more sustainable, even if it's less exciting, sustainable growth over the following few months, all driven by how we're managing community and optimizing for developer experience. And developer experience is something I'll be talking quite a bit about. So let's dive in here. So what does preparation actually mean? Well, there's many, many things we could go into. This isn't a marketing presentation, so I don't want to go into too many details and take too much of our time on this. However, I am going to share some things that I think are hopefully rather actionable for you. So how do you actually get these things done? Well, let's talk a little bit about the strategy and things that you really need to make sure you're going through. So there's so many products, so many projects that get created without real examination of the pain points, the use cases. What is it exactly that this product is achieving for the users and what does that mean? Well, I think one part of our success with DevLake was going through and having many conversations before we revealed this to the world, before we really launched this project, chatting with developers, chatting with everyone from open source maintainers of small projects to VPs of engineering at large enterprises to really understand what kind of pain points are you feeling with respect to the thing we're doing? How would you use this? What are the ways that you would potentially integrate this into your day-to-day -day life? And we go through this process to really identify what is a real pain point and how can we make sure that we're mapping all of our messaging, maybe even some of our development strategy and product strategy to more closely align with these things. This will also play a huge role in how you ultimately create all of your campaign materials to grow your project and to get people excited about it. And we'll talk about that in just a second. The next piece is use cases and perhaps most importantly, workflow mapping. 
So what do I mean by this? Well, what we found is, of course, many, many open source projects, certainly some of the most successful ones, are in and of themselves developer-centric things. They're either developer tools, they're developer utilities, they're frameworks, they're something that developers are using in the course of their day-to-day -day life as a professional engineer. So no technology, no product, no tool, no framework, none of them are going to work well with developers if there isn't a clear application as to how do I actually integrate this thing into my day-to-day -day life? So my recommendation here is not just to map out your use cases and come up with several. You don't know which is going to be most receptive. You don't know which people will be most excited about. And that's part of your testing as you build messages, as you create emails, as you create marketing assets like ads, like press releases, like blogs, like webinars, panels, you name it. There's a hundred different things you could do to market something like this. But none of it matters if you don't have clear use cases. And none of those use cases matter unless you have clear mapping to the workflow. So really ask yourself, what does this thing look like in the developer's day-to-day -day life? How and where are they going to install it? At what point in their day are they going to integrate this project into their life? Is this maybe something they're doing during the kind of the triage process of examining JIRA tickets or issues? Is this something that happens towards the end during the CI CD process? Is it part of the gating for something to go into production? Really getting into the details of this to really understand what does usage actually look like and what does this look like in the course of the day of our users? That's going to inform everything that you're doing. Lastly, you want to make sure that you're really thinking carefully about your messaging. How are you articulating these discoveries and how are you arranging them in a way where you can A-B test them? So what do I mean by A-B testing? Well, no one's perfect and no one gets it right perfectly the very first time, unless you're very lucky. So what you really need to do is go through this work that we've just discussed. Map out the different pain points that you understand to be most important. Map those to those use cases. Figure out how those are going to translate into day-to-day -day actions or week-to-week -week actions. Then figure out what this looks like in the workflow. What other tools or processes is your project or product integrating with or working with? What comes before and after they've used your product? And then you need to separate that into many distinct marketing messages and then test it. And that's going to help you identify not just what makes the best sense to your audience, but it's also going to perhaps uncover what use cases, what pain points, what workflow integrations are indeed most exciting for the people you want to target. So preparation also involves many more things. And I want to talk about some examples here and some details. Um, how do you make a launch really successful here? Well, as I mentioned, you've got to get all of these messages right. You've got to get the pain points right. Um, all of that feeds everything else that we're going to discuss today. And I want to give you some examples of how you can actually put this into practice. So in this case, we launched DevLake on Product Hunt. Um, Product Hunt is a great place to launch products of all kinds. I'm a huge fan of it. If any of you have questions or want to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to share my experience and expertise on this, having launched several products very successfully here. But here's the key things to keep in mind. As you can see here on the left, I created Twitter posts for our team to share. Nothing too overly promotional, quick, easy ways to articulate the value proposition of the thing that we're launching, and then making it as easy as I can possibly make it for our team to share the launch and the campaign, for them to share it with their friends, for them to share it. You want to make sure it's as easy as possible. You want to have all of this stuff ready to go, copy and paste, easy to share, that way, no one has to do any major work to be able to help your project get out of the gates and successfully launch. I also want to point out the screen on the right here, which is the campaign for DevLake on Product Hunt. You can see here we finished uh, ranked second of the day. Um, this resulted in many thousands of views from developers to our GitHub, um, really drove a lot of traction and adoption in those early first few hours and first few days of the launch. Now, what I can't show you, unfortunately, because of the history <laughs> is this, uh, this also gave us an opportunity to create a draft campaign page. So a placeholder campaign page that's really giving us the space to iterate on the graphics, the slides we're using, the messages, the headline, the logo, all of these things. And this is a fantastic way to really do some testing before you've even launched. And it's a key part of the preparation. So here's what I did to make this a success. So for preparing the campaign page, I went through and shared this with our team, got their feedback, integrated it, took some notes, figured out what I agreed with, maybe what I didn't. 
After that, I went to some of our partners, some of our friends, maybe some trusted advisors, and got them to do the same thing and ask them, what do you think this is? Can you explain it to me? Do you think it makes sense? What questions do you still have about this after seeing this page? I used all of those inputs to be able to continuously refine prior to the launch the best possible campaign page. So even if perhaps my instincts aren't perfect and maybe the final result of this isn't something that I think is perfect according to my feelings, the objective results that make this so easy is that I've now crafted a campaign page, I've crafted messaging that makes sense to the people I care about, that makes sense to answer all of their questions and makes it easy for them to understand and easy to share. All of these things are key parts of the preparation. So I could go on and on about preparation, as I mentioned. Instead, I want to share some of those key framework pieces. Get that right message, get the right time, get the right place, make things easy to share, go through iterations, integrate feedback, and be specific about who you're getting that feedback from so that you can refine the messaging, refine the presentation, figure out what questions people have, map it to the workflows, map it to the pain points. I promise if you do all of those things, the crafting of your messaging, the crafting of your ads, your campaigns, your blogs, your press releases, your product hunt page, whatever you're doing, it's going to be so much easier if you go through that methodically. So let's go now into the launch process. So I want to give you a little bit of a framework here for at least how I think about it and how we've launched some of our products and projects. So first, I like to talk about finding a good stage. So for me, I love product hunt as one of my stages. This is where you're really placing your product for people to be able to see it. There are many places you could do this, um, but you really want to create a central location where people can find out all of the key information in a really succinct, easy to share way. Answering the question, what is it? Who is it for? What's the background of this? What does it look like? Maybe what does it feel like? You know, can I see signals that prove that people care and that people value this team, that they value the technology? For me, Product Hunt is a perfect combination of all of these things because it allows for you to tap into influential members of the community who can write a comment, even in review and endorse the product and the team. It makes it easy to put together a bunch of content, videos, slides, images, explanations. It allows you to have a dialogue, so it's a great stage. And the thing that I really want to share here is that one of the most critical parts of your staging environment isn't just nailing these pieces around the what and the who and giving them these good senses of what does this all look like and who's endorsing it, but you also want to be able to capture the story. You know, why, why does this thing exist? Um, really starting with that why is so crucial. You know, what was the catalyst behind creating this thing? Why do you believe it should exist? Why do you believe people should care? Um, what is in it for you personally? Why, why do you believe in this thing? Being able to share that personal story and the team's personal story behind the project will pay massive dividends and finding that staging environment is essential. The next phase here, right, is your share phase. So now you've got your location where all of that information is living, your headquarters for the product launch. So in our example, that's product hunt. Then you want to go into the sharing mode, figure out where you're getting the right audience at the right time. For me, one of my favorites in the world is dev.to, which is a fantastic platform, really great team, fantastic community, sharing fantastic things all the time. Now for this location, this is where you get to go into more detail. The staging environment, the stage here gives you all of the information, all of the kind of marketing and sales piece of it. This is where you can get into more detail. And I think it's so important where you need to be able to communicate in your sharing phase, the why and the how. So go into more detail of explain why you believe your project needs to exist in detail. What problems is it solving? Why do existing solutions not necessarily address that in a way that you feel is sufficient or good enough? And very, very importantly, go into the how it works. Of course, the development community, especially the open source community, are some of the best and brightest minds in software development. You're not going to trick them and you should never ever try. So instead what you need to do is use this sharing opportunity to really communicate. How does this thing work? How does the project actually come together? And what are the limitations? What are the challenges that you had to overcome? The community responds incredibly well to this transparency. And if in all of this, you can successfully communicate the why and the how while simultaneously explaining what makes this thing unique and worth paying attention to, people are going to respond positively to it. In just one of our dev.to posts to launch DevLake, we were able to win 10,000 visitors from the community to our GitHub page. And I say win very specifically because 
you have to earn this, right? You have to earn it through transparency, through authenticity, through honesty, and there is luck involved. You're not going to create a perfect post 10 times out of 10 and get 10,000 visitors. But if you follow this framework, you're likely to at least succeed. Next, of course, is the good old GitHub location. No open source project is complete without it. And certainly for us, we are big believers in GitHub as our place to keep everything. So here, everything in my opinion comes from the readme, right? You really have to get into the details. So now someone's discovered it on your stage. They've looked into more details and learned more about it through some of the blog posts and some of the other promotional articles and explainers on places like dev.to, Hacker News, Medium, wherever you're sharing it, right? Many places where you can do that. Now they arrive at your GitHub page. And now this is where you need to be nice and clear and succinct about explaining to them, how does this project actually work? How do you implement it? How do you install it? How do you get it set up? What does it look like in your workflow? This is where you need to get really, really practical. Don't waste time on the salesy part and just explain to them as easily as possible because this is part of your key funnel here. How do you use this thing? And go again through those iterations, ask people for feedback, go through and edit that readme a hundred times until you feel like people are asking no challenging questions about the fundamentals of how to get started and how to get using that product. Last is the shout phase. So really kind of celebrating the launch, celebrating the product. How are you making sure people hear about it and know about it? Well, for me, I think one of the best places online to do that is Twitter. I think it offers this fantastic opportunity to be able to engage really organically through things like responses to people, through conversations, starting threads. But it also gives you this really powerful opportunity as well to do what we can call inorganic marketing, which is the kind of paid side of things, the marketing side of things, being able to put together specific ads that can really drive the, drive the conversation forward, drive visibility, but perhaps most importantly, target people based off of their interests. The open source community is driven very much by passion. So if you can really figure out in all of those processes we've already discussed, what pain points are they passionate about? What other projects, technologies, frameworks are they passionate about? And then you can target your campaigns based off of these things. You're going to find the right people with the right message at the right time. Now, what's the right message to layer into this shout phase? I want to really point out this idea of superpowers. As cheesy or silly as it might sound, I think it's so important in your ads to be able to express to people what's kind of this new capability that they're going to obtain by paying attention to this project. There has to be something, even if it's not super, super exciting, superpower might be a strong word for this, but really figure out what's this new thing that they can now do or accomplish that they couldn't do before. And if you can articulate that in your shout phase of this launch and marketing, then people are going to care and they're gonna get excited. So I want to give a good example of this. And I think the reason I want to share this particular example is because to me, this is fantastically simple. There's not too much happening here. It's not complicated. Um, it's not too clever. There isn't any sexy or impressive graphics involved, but it works. It works incredibly well. So this particular Twitter ad I ran for the launch of DevLake and drove a, a net click-through rate, that's the CTR there, of 14.3%. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with marketing and product launches, traditionally a click-through rate of maybe 0.5% is where you start to feel excited, start to feel good. Um, this outperformed by a factor of perhaps 12X, um, a very successful and very efficient and effective campaign. Now, what you'll see here is a few basic things. We're trying to communicate really quickly what that superpower is. All your dev data, one view, nice and simple. You couldn't do it before, now you can. It answers the what? Well, it's Jira, it's GitHub, it's GitLab, it's Jenkins, and you see a dashboard there. So it makes it nice and easy to communicate that visually to the people seeing it. Then we wanted to explain in a single sentence what this thing actually is. It's all your dev tools in one personalized data lake and dashboard. Of course, making it clear to them, this is free and open source. There's no part of this that's going to require them to swipe a credit card or pay. And then an exciting, exciting way to capture it. So in our case, more dev, less ops really spoke to our audience. It communicated to them that we understand them, where many of the developers we spoke to said, hey, I'm most excited about building. I want to write code. I want to create products. I want to solve problems. I don't want to do the operations side of things. I don't want to do the JIRA tickets and the project management. That isn't the fun part of this. So for me, 
Creating this quick campaign slogan, more dev, less ops, communicated to our audience that we understood that and that we're on the same page with them. And most importantly, we want to bring them that superpower. So this ad drove thousands and thousands of visits to our GitHub page and resulted in a fantastic amount of momentum. So what else should be on your list when you're going through this launch? Again, this isn't a marketing presentation, so I don't want to spend too much time going deep into the tactics. And if you'd like to learn more, please reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or email. I'll share it at the end, and I'd love to chat with you, help you, and see how we could work together. But other things you should be thinking about. Figure out what Reddit subreddits your community, your target developers and audience are living in, and find ways to engage there organically and without being too promotional. LinkedIn, again, great place to share things. This is where you can maybe be a bit more promotional, where maybe you're targeting the kind of enterprise users um, or more professional engineers, um, finding ways to get in front of them there. Press releases, while not necessarily the most impactful thing in the world, are a great way to start spreading the word about your project. Perhaps most importantly, helps the name of your project get into many different publications that get indexed online that supports your SEO. So it makes your product and project ultimately more discoverable in the long term. Blog posts are also a key part. I suggest not sharing more than two links for blog posts. So what do I mean by this? When you're going through that launch phase, you don't want to be building momentum in 15 different places and diluting it. Ideally, you want to concentrate any momentum that you're building with things like likes, comments, shares, things like that, upvotes. You want it to be all in one or two locations, ideally. So in our example, we pro produced our primary blog for the launch on dev.to. And then we shared that on Twitter. We shared it on LinkedIn. We shared it through email. We shared it with friends, directing them all to this one place so that all of their comments, all of their upvotes, all count in a huge way and help you build that momentum. And as you start to build that momentum, you begin to show up in trending lists. You begin to show up on the front pages. And that makes a massive, massive difference in terms of bringing that visibility to your project. You also want to think about how you can recruit or engage key opinion leaders, um, influencers, right? You don't have to be too formal about this. Perhaps it's as simple as figuring out who has some of the most interesting opinions on the problem space that you're addressing. Find ways to get, get in touch with them. Twitter is often a great way. LinkedIn can be a great way. WhatsApp, WeChat, all great places. But reach out to them and ask them sincerely, hey, we're building this project or we're iterating on this project and we would really value your feedback. Would you mind taking a look? And if you like it, we'd really appreciate if you shared it. But if it isn't of interest, no hard feelings and thank you for considering it. This kind of authentic, friendly message can go a tremendously long way. And if you get a few shares and a few testimonials, a few endorsements from those KOLs, it makes a massive difference. So let's talk now about what happens next. So everything I've covered, we've gone through the preparation, right? The preparation showing you these key frameworks, these key goals that you need to navigate to get your messaging, your presentation, all of this perfectly aligned. Then we went through the launch phase. We talked about where do you stage all of that information? Where do you share that information? Where do you shout about it? How do you explain it? What are the different platforms, activities, and tactics that you use to bring that attention to your project? Now we're gonna talk a little bit about community growth and developer experience to discuss how it is that you actually go into this more sustainable growth curve where you're no longer focused on big splash launches, high volume you know, visits to your GitHub, but instead are really looking to translate all of this momentum into something that continues because people love it. I really like to think about building great community and growing that community by thinking again, using a framework for what makes this successful and what makes it work for people. So this framework I came up with, I like to refer to as the four C's of contributor conviction. Now, it's just a fun way to capture it and make it a little more interesting, but it boils down to things that you probably have thought about and things that you're already doing. It's a great way to split apart these massive tasks into some more digestible, easy to manage things. So questions I like to ask when I'm thinking about community management. From a code perspective, if I'm a developer, how easy is it to get up to speed with the code? This is things like documentation, good comments, good tutorials, an accessible community that will provide answers. Are there opportunities to join huddles that are transparent where you can really kind of get up to speed with the project, the new releases, the challenges, new issues, things like that. And if you don't have a methodical approach to managing these things, you're never going to get contributor conviction because it's gonna to be too challenging for them to engage. 
You also have to think about the overall purpose and theme of your community. Now, it's critical to remember that no one is going to join your community just for the project, or at least they're never going to stay, which is perhaps the most important part. They need a purpose. They need a theme. They need some bigger mission that's wrapped into the community to really stay. So I like to think a lot about what the purpose is. So in our case with DevLake, we like to focus on data-driven engineering. So if you're an engineer that cares about the role of data in delivering great projects, great code, building great teams, building more sustainably, building more efficiently, our community is the place for you. So it doesn't have to be just about our project and our product. In fact, in some ways, it's not about that at all. It's about the bigger purpose that our project is serving. And by virtue of that, we get people that are happy to engage, happy to stay, and want to share the community with others. Of course, very importantly, you have to ask, is the community active and accessible? So if there's only one post a month, people aren't responsive, and it's not easy to get involved, then it's going to be a challenge, and you're not going to get contributor conviction. You also have to ask, is my community true to the open source spirit? And I think an easy way to think about that is, is it merit driven? Is it accessible? Is it transparent? Are decisions made behind the scenes with just a few people or are they discussed in public? Are there opportunities for people to ask questions or to challenge things? Do the best ideas move forward? If the answer is yes to many of those things, then your community is probably true to the open source spirit. Developers will love that and they'll want to stay. But if you're not nailing those things, you're going to struggle. The next piece I like to refer to is concierge. And this is really the role of any of your community leaders and certainly your lead maintainers. But it's really about building that community that serves your community members. Remember, they don't serve you, you serve them. How do you serve them? Well, some of it's very simple. Are you effectively welcoming them? Are you greeting them when they join your Slack or join a Zoom? or any part of your community? Are they feeling like this is a place where they're embraced and valued? As they look to get involved, are they given good guidance through good documentation, maybe through open coding or debugging sessions? Is it easy for them to kind of get up to speed and feel like they can really make an impact? And of course, do they feel safe, respected, and appreciated? If there's anyone in your community that is mean to other people or they're attacking ideas or disrespecting people, or not being productive and constructive in how they're engaging, you have to find ways to either correct their behavior or remove them, because this is the key part of a great community, of course. And I want to share one quick example here, just to prove this, some simple things. So this is a very recent tweet, uh, just this last week, in fact, um, where during one of our open source huddles, I saw that a new member of our community had joined and asked a question. So in the middle of our discussion, I recognized them and thanked them and said, hey, thanks for joining. That's a great question. And by the way, I'm so happy that you're part of our community. And they immediately celebrated this fact on Twitter, you know, making it, making it uh, visible to other people. And it's such an easy example here of showing that just by being a welcoming leader and acknowledging your members can go such a long way in getting people excited and making them feel happy and engaged. The last piece here I like to refer to as calling, which you can think about as purpose. And it really just boils down to this. How can you make sure that the developers engaging with your community and engaging with your project feel like there is some bigger purpose for them in the project? Do they have specific issues to pursue? Do they have specific, specific bugs to solve? Do they have new features or integrations to support or help? Maybe a specific PR to review? Do they have purpose? Is it clear? But then on a personal level, do they also have purpose? you need to find out how you can help support your community members achieve their goals by being part of your project. And if you nail this part, if they have a purpose in both their tasks, as well as how the community and how the project is serving their goals, personal and professional, I promise you, you'll have loyal and excited members of your community. So I want to talk now as part of this community growth about data-driven developer experience, something that we care a tremendous amount about and I attribute a lot of our success to. We really think about things in terms of quantitative numbers wherever we can to make sure that we're constantly improving and driving a great experience for the people that help us build our community and build our project. So here's an example. This is actually one of our internal DevLake dashboards. And it's a good example of what I mean by data-driven community development. So I shared with you that 
tools like Orbit give us the insights on social media. And I think many of you probably know what that looks like and are probably thinking about that already. This perhaps you haven't thought about so much or haven't seen before. And it's what we're really excited about to bring to other open source projects and communities with DevLake. So in this case, we're tracking some really critical SLAs, um, the targets, the benchmarks that we want to consistently achieve to make sure that our code base, the project, the community are great places for developers to contribute. So some things that we're tracking, and this is not all of it, it's just some good examples. We like to think through things like the initial, you know, the initial time to respond to an issue. So of course, if a developer submits a new issue, they create and open a new issue, and it takes days and days and days for them to get a response. Naturally, they're going to lose interest. Maybe they're going to find something else to focus on. So it's a critical thing to focus on. We also track things like the PR resolution time. Like how long is it actually taking for something that's submitted to either get a clear response or to move forward in the process? Um, making sure that's happening in a timely fashion is really critical. And then other things, right? Like how, what's the percentage of those PRs that are actually getting properly resolved and getting resolved within the time timeline that you've established. So of course, in general, it's always best to have the highest percentages of resolved issues, resolved PRs. You want as much of the developer contribution as possible going into production. That's a measure of success, of course, because it means they're writing great code, you're providing good issues, and then the benchmarks to be able to merge into production are all well, well communicated and clear. Um, so more, more is always better, but perhaps most importantly, this is a good way to actually establish some clear thresholds. That way you're not just constantly trying to do more. You're not just constantly trying to do faster, you know, more tasks, more issues, more PRs, but instead you're establishing a really clear benchmark of here's how we're defining success. Here's what we believe makes our project great. Here's how we can define to what extent we're being responsive to our community. And all of that makes a massive difference. If developers feel that you're responsive, then they're going to be excited to move forward. So speaking of benchmarks, I wanted to finish my talk here with a little bit of insights that we've surfaced from our own analysis. So we decided that we've put together a great set of dashboards and benchmarks to determine what makes a great developer experience. We talked about things like PR resolution time, good first issues, things of this nature. And we've established our own benchmarks for DevLake that help us grow our community. And as you can see by our growth, it is paying dividends and we continue to grow today. So we wanted to see, well, how does the Apache community stand when compared to the leading open source projects? And how do the Apache incubator projects compare to those projects, to both the Apache ecosystem at large, as well as to the leading open source projects? So before I present this information, I want to share a few key pieces of information to make it more understandable. So firstly, we compared the open source projects that we compared Apache, as well as the incubator projects to, we chose the leading open source projects. So the projects with the most stars, the most traction, the most adoption, the biggest and best projects that exist. We also went through and did some basic data cleaning to make sure that we were accounting for things like bots and things like multiple accounts to clean up the data. So some simple processes that we put in place to make sure that the data was as accurate and human-based as we could possibly make it. And if you're interested to learn more about those processes and techniques that we use to do this, or simply want to read more into this data, please send me a message through email, Twitter, or LinkedIn, and I'll be happy to share all of those details with you. Now we'll jump into that data and we're going to keep it nice and high level. So as you can see here, we use DevLake to assess the days to initial issue response and compared that, as I mentioned, between the Apache incubator projects, the Apache ecosystem in general, and then these leading non-Apache projects. So the key takeaway here, as you can see, is that overall, the Apache incubator projects are extremely responsive, which is a great sign. It shows that the maintainers, the community members are all extremely engaged and looking to help their community members as quickly as they can. Overall, it also shows that the Apache ecosystem is a more responsive community when compared to many of the largest projects which I think is something that's really cool to see and something that the Apache ecosystem should be proud of. Again, we see some more data in a similar theme where the days to the initial review of a PR 
are fastest in the incubator projects. Overall, the Apache projects are beating the leading open source projects across the board, which is really cool to see. Again, indicating that the Apache ecosystem is more responsive and faster moving than many of these larger leading projects. Now, of course, a key thing to consider in all of this is that for the non-Apache projects, we chose the largest, most popular projects. Those are projects that have massive code bases. They have a lot of complications. They maybe have a more complicated review process. Um, maybe they're run by committees or consortiums. So of course, there are challenges that are going to make them slower and less responsive when compared to younger startup-based teams and perhaps other Apache projects. Even with that in mind, I think the data tells a great story and shows that the Apache ecosystem is doing very well when compared to some of the best projects in the world. This is another interesting piece, which I think presents some opportunities for improvements. So you can see here, as I mentioned, if a developer has many good first issues, it's easier for them to get started on engaging with a project. If there are no good first issues, it's going to be really challenging for them to find an opportunity to jump in and to solve a problem and to get code into production. So here you can see, which isn't super surprising, that the Apache incubator projects tend to have the fewest number of good first issues. Now, this does make sense because what this is really showing is that perhaps for a really fast moving young project, the issues are created and solved so quickly that there isn't an opportunity to give them the good first issue label and tag. And as a result, there's fewer of them. But in the Apache ecosystem generally, you can see that the overall number of first good first issues is less than some of the leading projects. So for all of you maintainers listening, this is a great opportunity to really improve. Figure out ways where you can identify and then label these good first issues to make your project more available and more accessible to new contributors. We have PR resolution days here. So you can see here some interesting results. The non-Apache leading projects are, of course, a lot more stable across the board. They're more consistent. Unsurprisingly, the younger, faster moving projects are much more erratic. Sometimes they're much faster. Sometimes they're much slower. Um, there aren't too many action items that come from this. However, I think this is interesting data regardless. Another key piece here, the overall number and ratio of unmerged PR closures. So you can see here the overall, the non-Apache projects have many, a higher level at least of unmerged PR closures, while the incubator projects are generally merging most everything. This doesn't surprise me. And I think the key takeaway from this data is to demonstrate that Apache ecosystem when compared to the leading projects is again, leading the way and providing a more responsive, more effective pathway as a general rule, something to be proud of. Finally, we want to look here at PR resolution days. So really kind of how fast is a project engaging and how effectively are they moving through this process? And once again, unsurprisingly, these younger, earlier projects are moving very quickly. But importantly, the Apache ecosystem is moving more quickly and more effectively when compared to these leading ecosystem projects. Again, something that's very cool to see. So that's my presentation. I hope that in this process, you feel like you've learned quite a bit about the things you should be thinking about as you prepare, the ta tactics that you should be going through when you launch, and the data-driven approaches that you can take to growing and evolving your community once you've launched and once you're going into that growth phase. We also talked about some interesting data about the Apache ecosystem comparing the Apache ecosystem to the incubator projects, these young, fast moving open source projects. And we also compared them to the leading largest, most popular open source projects in the world. And the results speak for themselves. The incubator projects are moving really fast and they're doing very well. And across the board, the Apache ecosystem is outperforming the best projects in the world. So this is a great opportunity to say how proud I am to be part of the Apache ecosystem, how proud I am to lead DevLake and thank you so much for your time and for listening today. You can reach me here on Twitter. My handle is simply my name, at Maxim Wheatley. My inbox is open for any of you. Please send me a note at maxim at merico.dev. And you can visit our website, www.merico.dev, or for our Chinese audience, www.merico.cn. And you'll be able to see all about the products and projects that we're working on. And of course, check out DevLake 
on its Apache website at devlake.apache.org. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. It's an honor to be part. It's an honor to be part of Apache Con Asia. I look forward to hearing from all of you. I hope to chat with many of you. I would love to hear your feedback and your thoughts, and I hope to see you again soon at the next conference.